Greetings, everybody. Namaste. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you, very honored to be part of uh, something called a Distinguished Speaker Series. I never think of myself as particularly distinguished, but I do hope I have something uh, to offer. Um, as, as was indicated, I've been uh, studying the impact of the teachings that have come to the West from India for some years now. And my book, American Veda, which is now 10 years old, almost 11, uh, summarizes that history. And I'm going to summarize the summary <laughs> in, in as short a period of time as I, I can. And with a warning, uh, I, I have given the same talk and spoke for, you know, 90 minutes, you know, so um, I'm going to give you the condensed version if I can control myself. There's just so much to say. Let me begin by first saying that the, the impact of especially Vedanta philosophy and yoga in the West, along with Buddhism, which I have not studied uh, in as great a depth, but the, the, the core teachings that were birthed in India, in the, in the Himalayas and the forests many, many, many centuries ago, and that have been kept alive found their way to America and over the course of a couple of hundred years have had a radical and profound impact on American life, much more than people uh, generally appreciate. And when I say we're becoming a nation of yogis, people look at me <laughs> in a strange way, because they think I mean all the people going to yoga studios and carrying their yoga mats. That's part of the story, but it's a small part of the story and a, and a minor one, really, uh, and a recent one. What I mean is, over time, growing numbers of people, of Americans, have become in their spiritual lives, in their lives in general, more like they have more of a yogic approach to their spiritual and personal development. And that trend has grown and grown and grown. Now, what do I mean by that? If you look at surveys and Organizations like the Pew Research uh, people and uh, Gallup, they do these studies from time to time. What do people, how do people practice their spirituality? What do they think of religion? What are their attitudes? And what you see over time and with each generation, more and more people, especially when they're young, moving in this direction away from a religion centered in dogma and belief toward what you could call an experience-centered spirituality, where, where inner experience of the divine or the sacred, the inner experience of unity, that is the, the hallmark of yoga, that has become more important than belief systems independent questing, seeking, searching for truth and answers and, and experience has become more important than being loyal to an institution 
or the, especially the institution, the, the, or, the religious uh, tradition that you were born into. Uh, social scientists call that questing spirituality as opposed to dwelling spirituality. Toward a view of the universe and our place in it that we could call non-dual, one that emphasizes unity, a very yogic viewpoint, as opposed to the kind of dualistic theology that's been dominant in the West that sees the human separate from the divine. Mm -hmm. And also a, an understanding of what we are as human beings. The, the, the definition of the self away from what certain schools of theology in the West have called fallen, that you know, we're born in sin and we're at, at our core sort of depraved toward a vision of the self that you, you find in the Upanishads and the Gita. A self of sat, chit, ananda. Mm -hmm. A self that is the same self as the universal self. And away from uh, exclusivity, that my religion has the only truth or the most uh, advanced or the most um, the one that leads to salvation toward an acceptance of all legitimate pathways as a acceptable pathways to the experience of yogic unity or the divine. The truth is one and the wise call it by many names. More and more uh, people agree with that saying from the Rig Veda. So you find these trends and we ask, how did that happen? There's many factors having to do with, you know, American culture, America as a, as a uh, immigrant nation, um, America that has uh, quality as its founding documents and all that. But it's my observation and my contention that without access to the teachings that, to the Indic teachings, this would not have been possible to at least to the same degree. Because you see over time, the more access people have to Vedantic teachings, to yogic teachings, to non-dual Buddhist teachings, the more they move in that direction. And you could see that throughout the culture. So having said that, I want to give you a sense of how this came about historically. Over the course of a couple of hundred years, starting in earnest at the sort of early part of the 19th century, this access starts to increase and more and more people are transformed personally by their engagement with a Vedanta philosophy and the teachings of yoga. And those people in turn, in many cases, inform others of it. They become transmitters themselves. They adopt these teachings in certain cases of certain kinds of people 
they incorporated it into how they see the world, how they experience the world. It becomes part of their expertise, their work. And if they become successful and well-known figures in different areas of life, they communicate these teachings to others, sometimes in explicit ways and sometimes in very subtle ways that you have to look for. It's not obvious, but it comes through and it ends up filtering into the, the society, into the fabric of American life. So over time, they seep in to con into the consciousness of the people. This has come about through different streams and tributaries, some mighty and some, you know, trickles and subtle ways that the teachings seep into the soil of, of America. And the most important, most significant, and the most visible were the series of gurus and swamis and yogacharyas who have come here and who had an impact. Many, many have come. Some have had a big impact. So I want to begin with them and I, I'll show you the pictures as we go along. Let me uh, share the screen. Okay, have, um, are you seeing it? You see Vivekananda? Yes. yes, we do. Okay, I can't see the button for, um, oh, here, okay. Okay, that's better. So this, you're all familiar with him. <laughs> so I won't, I can speak for hours about every one of the people I'm going to mention, but uh, you know we can't. Let it, suffice it to say, uh, this is a poster from when Vivekananda was speaking here in 1893. You all know he came to to uh, Chicago in 1893 to speak at the World's Parliament of Religions. This had an enormous impact. Not just, it had a, a big impact in and of itself. And, and the story of him coming to Chicago uh, is, is wonderful. And just to appreciate it, understand that in 1893, America was a, a Protestant nation. Very few Americans had ever met a Jew and, and Catholics were still being discriminated against. They were a new immigrant group and, and the Protestants held them in contempt to a large extent. So a dark skinned Hindu in orange robes representing what most Americans would have thought of as a primitive religion from a backward country was not expected to impress people. And the people running the parliament, some of them, some of them were good and decent people, but a lot of them, their agenda was to demonstrate the superiority of Protestant religion and that it, as the most advanced in the world. So Vivekananda becoming the uh, superstar and the main attraction at the parliament was not expected. And it's one of the reasons the impact of that is so great. In his time here, and as you know, he stayed beyond the parliament. He was here only a few years, but he set the template for all the teachers to come. And he also showed in the reaction to him, the two kinds of Americans. There were Americans who opposed him who thought he was preaching heathen, <laughs> he was 
speaking the devil's tongue, you know, they, they try to, you know, suppress him and all that. There's always been that kind of American. They're here right now, as you all know. But the other kind of American is open-minded, curious, pragmatic, and if somebody has something that sounds reasonable and might have uh, something to offer, they want to know about it. And if they try it out and it seems to work, they're all for it. Those are the people who flocked to see Vivekananda and who went to see him when he traveled around the country. Some of them became disciples, close disciples. And what he left behind were of massive volumes of written material and the establishment of the Vedanta Society centers in some of the major cities. And when he went back to India and uh, at the Ramakrishna mission and Mutt outside of Calcutta, Belar Mutt, where swamis were being trained, some of those swamis he brought to America to run these centers. And over time, more of them opened up. So there was Vedanta societies and Vedanta swamis from the uh, lineage of Ramakrishna and Vivekananda in America in the early part of the 20th century. And they were, that was the place, those were the places where anybody interested in Indian philosophy, Indian thought could go. But of course it was small in number. This is you know, early 20th century. Transportation and communication were uh, not what they are now to say the least. But it's important to realize that Vivekananda didn't come into a vacuum. Going back to the early part of the 19th century, books about Indian philosophy and Buddhism, essentially books about Hinduism and Buddhism as it would have been called then. Um, first translation of the Gita, other works and essays and articles written by Westerners, mostly British, who overcame the colonialist uh, viewpoint and saw value in the uh, Hindu Dharma, in the, in the traditional teachings of India. Many of them studied it because they were trying to help the missionaries convert people, but they found that there was value in it, that these were reasonable teachings and we can learn from it. Those books that they wrote, those articles, and when they came back to the Britain or Germany, they would give talks. They had an impact. It influenced some of the leading British philosophers and poets. And eventually they came to America, primarily to New England. Boston was the intellectual center of America back then. And the uh, Unitarian people were very open-minded and they started societies and journals to study what they would have called Asian religions and uh, Hindu teachings. And eventually in that environment, uh, these books got into the hands of Ralph Waldo Emerson and Henry David Thoreau and the school of people who came to be known as the transcendentalists. Uh, again, I could talk for hours about this, but Emerson and Thoreau especially were deeply impacted by the library of books that they obtained it influenced their philosophy and their way of being in the world. They both became enormously influential thinkers in the history of America, especially 
Emerson in, in his lifetime. And they transformed the way many Americans came to understand religion and spirituality. And they do to this day. Every person who goes to school in America reads Emerson and Thoreau, or at least one of them. And the influence is there. It also had an impact. They had an impact. And the books that I mentioned had an impact still before Vivekananda came on the group of uh, spiritual teachers known as the New Thought Movement. They include Madame Blavatsky, who started Theosophy, which you've all heard about and know about because it had a big impact on India in the early 20th century. And, and theosophists were very active in the Indian independence movement. It had an impact on Mary Baker Eddy, who started Christian Science, on Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, who started Unity Churches that still exist. I give talks at them very frequently, and it always blows the mind of the people in the audience to know that it was started with inspiration and knowledge that Charles Fillmore gained from these books and teachings about India, from India. And they were at the parliament when Vivekananda spoke around the same time they started Unity Churches. And this is a later person, Ernest Holmes, who started something called Science of Mind that are now called Centers uh, for Spiritual Living. They're very popular in America. And they seem like churches, but if you look at what they're teaching, it's much more yoga, much more Vedanta than conventional Christianity. It's, these are fascinating developments. And then, of course, Vivekananda came, and there was an embodiment of these teachings and a human being conveying them, not just books. Then we come to 1920 when Paramahansa Yogananda came and he was the next most influential, the next in that line of highly influential teachers. And he stands out for several reasons, one of which is he stayed here. He lived in America with the exception of one year back in India from 1920 until his death in 1952. That's a long time to establish roots. And he too left behind volumes and volumes of books and written material. And in his case, toward the end of his life, also film and uh, audio recordings. He lived long enough for that. And centers everywhere, his self-realization fellowship and the properties they own, the centers that continue to this day to uh, promote his teachings to this day very influential and mainly because of the publication of his uh, seminal memoir autobiography of a yogi which had a huge impact still does but especially on my generation of seekers back in the 1960s I still have my copy that I borrowed from somebody in 1970 and never returned and I always say I wrote a biography of Yogananda a couple of years ago that fills in the gaps of his life that he didn't write about. And I always say I, I, I'm paying off the karma for stealing somebody's book and not returning. He was the main, he and the ongoing influence of the Vedanta Society continued through uh, the Depression, World War II, the post-war years, and then after his passing, the institutions they established continued it. But then in the 1960s, started this massive explosion of interest in Indian spiritual teachings. This It's due to a confluence of factors having to do with um, suddenly the advent of mass media, uh, 
commercial uh, airlines, jet travel, the changes in American immigration policy, and the generation of young people that I'm part of that just started questioning everything and created what we used to call the counterculture, questioning everything about life that we were being taught and searching for new ideas, new ways of being in the world. And part of that was a spiritual quest. And at, by then the availability, the access to all these teachings was far greater than at any previous time in history. The books became available, books about Indian philosophy by famous uh, and respected elders. And then the gurus started to come. And so there were so many influential uh, gurus in the 60s and 70s that I created a, a collage. And we, we don't have time to uh, go into each one of them, but I write about each one in, in American Veda and they, they, all do, they all actually deserve more space than I had for them. And so that's one of the reasons I wrote a biography of Yogananda and others have had biographies written about them. And of course, you know, you can Google any of them, but I'll, I'll, let me just single out a few. This of course is uh, Jiddu Krishnamurti who was discovered by the uh, theosophists uh, in the early, early it, on a beach in uh, Chennai then Madras, and uh, when he was a, a, a teenager, and they groomed him, they brought him to England and educated him, and he was going to be the savior, the new messiah, and they did a world tour, and then he decided, you know what, I don't want to be the messiah, I don't like this, and I'm giving this all up, and his teaching then became, it's, if you look at his teachings, and it's highly intellectual, he was a brilliant man, it, but it's pure Vedanta. But he did not like gurus, he did not like organized religion, he did not like institutions, he thought you could just be an independent uh, seeker of truth and take care of it on your own and have these uh, spiritual awakenings like the one he had spontaneously didn't turn out to be the case. And the more famous he became, and the more he denounced gurus, the more famous the gurus became, and the more people treated him like a guru. It was very uh, interesting irony there. But had a huge impact. This is a Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who from 1967 or so, into the, for the next 10 years was by far the most famous of the gurus because in 1967, the Beatles learned his method of transcendental meditation after he'd been traveling the world teaching small numbers of people many times. And the I'll come back to the Beatles, but they were so famous and so popular among young people that there was this explosion of interest in meditation and his form of meditation. So suddenly he was on national television and the covers of magazines. It, it was an enormous, enormous thing. I went to spend time with him. I was trained by him to be a teacher of his uh, form of meditation, which in India was called Bhavati Dhyan. In America, it was called Transcendental Meditation, or in the West, in English. And uh, it, the, the impact was enormous, in large part because he encouraged people, scientists, to do studies about what happens during the practice. And those studies were published in reputable journals. They were picked up by medical uh, people, by psychologists, and that led to the mainstreaming of the practice of meditation and the medical use of it, a therapeutic use of it, which in turn gave acceptability to the full package of what yoga represented. So between Yogananda and the Swamis of uh, the Vedanta Society and this watershed moment when meditation became that popular, 
everything exploded after that. And all the other teachers in turn became more popular because the interest in anything Indian became huge, especially among young people in the 70s. This is of course, Srila Prabhupada uh, who brought the Hare Krishna movement here, Gaudiya Vaishnavism. Now, one thing to keep in mind is that if you look at this assemblage of teachers just from the 70s, you see a huge variety of teachings. It rep they represent not even the complete, but almost the complete spectrum of what we think of as Dharmic teachings of Hinduism. Uh, and all the different schools of yoga and all the different schools of Vedanta and, and tantric teachings and everything else. And they all had their lineages. They all had their approach to bringing out the core essence of the teachings and they all attracted different people. Prabhupada was the bhakta. And at the time he was here, uh, you know, people chanting kirtan in the streets just seemed very strange and everybody just thought they were silly hippies and they were annoying. But he had a big impact over time. And now kirtan is, is a hugely popular thing among uh, people interested in yoga and uh, different, you know, forms of spiritual experience. Swami Muktananda came for the first time in 1970, and he, he brought with him the phenomenon of Shaktipat and uh, brought out explanations of Kundalini and Kundalini yoga experience that people hadn't before, and mainly the teachings of Kashmir Shaivism. This is his successor who became a guru in her own right. And I, I include her here because most of the teachers in that era, when they left, when they died, they left behind institutions they established, buildings, ashrams, organizations. And those organizations did not have gurus succeeding the founding guru. They took on a, a sort of educational nonprofit, usually, uh, sort of organization with a board of trustees and leaders, but not guru figures. Guru Maya, she was called, was an exception. And she was an exception because she was a woman. And that was very rare back then and was very important to American, young American women who then had a role model of what one could be as a spiritual seeker, as opposed to, you know, as one person put it to me, all the others were grandpa, but Guru Mai was a young woman and that mattered. This is Swami Satchidananda, this is Swami Vishnu Devananda. They were both disciples of Swami Shivananda of Rishikesh. And they brought classical eight limb yoga to America with more of an emphasis on asana than the other teachers were doing at the time. And they were the first to train Western yoga, what we now think of as yoga teachers. Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, a.k.a. Osho, was the most provocative of them, the most uh, controversial. He left behind a mixed legacy of scandal, but also of followers who to this day will tell you how their lives changed for the better because of his methods and his teaching. I'll skip some of the others. I want to mention uh, uh, BKS Iyengar and Patabi Joyce, who were both uh, disciples of Krishnamacharya, the great reformer and uh, innovator of Hatha Yoga. And when they came in the mid to late 70s, they really emphasized what we call postural yoga, asana and proper alignment and physiology. And they, for better and for worse, were the main uh, impetus for the popularity for what we now think of as yoga, the yoga studios and the hatha yoga emphasis, the emphasis on asana. 
At the same time, all the other teachers and the institutions they left behind had a greater emphasis on meditation and uh, Vedanta philosophy. And so even though a Hatha yoga gets most of the attention, the, the full package of yoga was never, it never disappeared. It's always been with us. I wanna also quickly mention that some of the teachers who never came here, some of the great masters, Ramana Maharshi, Sri Aurobindo, Neem Karoli Baba, Ananda Moy Ma, and as I mentioned, Shivananda and Krishnamacharya, they had a big impact because of Westerners who were with them in India and brought their books back, brought their teachings back, represented them here, made people aware of them. The most important American starting in, in the early 70s, maybe to this day, who, who uh, became a representative of these teachings and brought them out to large numbers of people, the, the person who started out as the psychologist Richard Alpert and who became known as Ramdas, he met Neem Karoli Baba when he was in India searching for uh, answers to certain questions. Neem Karoli was a very hardly known. He was just a reclusive guru in the uh, foothills of the Himalayas. And then because of Ramdas, many, many people came to study with him, including a number of people who became very prominent Americans who to this day will tell you he was their inspiration. And of course, the gurus keep coming. They're, these are some of the, the, the most prominent ones who still come to the West you know, before COVID and presumably after. Uh, Ama and Sri Sri Ravi Shankar, who I always like this picture because he's advertising the hardcover of my book. <laughs> Product placement, we call it. And uh, Karuna Mai, who, uh, has a you know ashram in Bangalore and comes frequently, usually once a year. And Sadhguru, who's here now, actually, I interviewed him yesterday uh, for the release of his new book. Um, and these people, you know, gain big followings and um, continue the tradition of gurus who come here and who welcome Westerners to their places in India. So I'm going to stop sharing now because I want to talk. And if I show pictures, it'll take too long. I want to now mention that in addition to the teachers that we just met, and in addition to the literature that over time become more and more abundant and more and more accessible. I will tell you, when I first heard of the Bhagavad Gita, I was a student and I said, oh, I wanna read this. Thoreau read it and he, he praised it. I wanna go get, and I couldn't find a copy. And I was in college in New York City and I couldn't find a copy until someone told me about an, an esoteric occult specialty bookstore in lower Manhattan called Wiser's. And that's where I found the copy. And it changed my life. And now, of course, you can go online and get, you know, 25 different translations and a few clicks of a mouse. But what happened through the books and through the teachers was, as I mentioned earlier, people would embrace the teachings they would find it of great, the teachings of great value in transforming their lives and ch changing the way they looked at the world. They would then incorporate it into their field of expertise and transmit it to others. And some of the people who did that became enormously famous. And that's a, another way these teachings reached massive numbers of people. Some of them were public thinkers like Emerson and Thoreau in the 19th century, but in the 20th century, they were people like Aldous Huxley, the great religious scholar, Houston Smith, who wrote the foreword to American Veda, 
the great, the very famous Joseph Campbell, Alan Watts. These are people who As young, well, in the, with the Huxley was already famous when he met uh, Swami uh, Prabhu Vananda in uh, Los Angeles and became immersed in Vedanta philosophy. So was his fellow Brit, uh, Christopher Isherwood, who was a famous novelist. But they became so enthusiastic, they started a publishing company to publish books about Vedanta. And they did, Isherwood and, Prab and Swami P collaborated on books together and Huxley would write the introductions. Hugely popular. Houston Smith was a young man and met the Swami in St. Louis, Vedanta Society Swami. His life changed. He was already a PhD in comparative religion, but now his teachings reflected a Vedantic view a yogic view of religion, and that he became world famous as a scholar of religion, and that would come through in his teaching. Similarly, Joseph Campbell studied with Swami Nikolananda in New York, and then became world famous as a uh, interpreter of the world's religious teachings and mythologies. Alan Watts was a, uh, an Episcopal uh, minister, and he discovered the teachings of the East and became a cult figure in the 70s as a translator and uh, interpreter of the teachings. People like me couldn't get enough of this. That's why I dropped out of graduate school. I only wanted to read that stuff. Physicists spoke about Vedanta philosophy. Tesla knew Vivekananda and wrote about him. Werner Heisenberg, Erwin Schrodinger, all these people, mm -hmm. and later people like Fritz Kapper, who wrote a very influential book comparing quantum mechanics to Eastern spiritual teachings called the Tao of Physics. Psychologists from William James to Carl Jung to later the hugely influential uh, people who started humanistic psychology and transpersonal psychology were directly influenced by the gurus who came by the, the books about Indian philosophy and they, trans, they, they transformed psychology by adding layers of possibility of human development that the yogis had written about and that yoga practices can lift people into. I mentioned the studies that were done because of the popularity of Maharishi's TM on meditation. That led to the use of the interest uh, in, in the medical use of it and uh, of, the, of the practical application of yogic teachings. And now there are of course thousands and thousands of studies and famous doctors who advocate yoga and meditation. It influenced directly uh, certain uh, uh, Catholic priests and Jewish rabbis who changed the way they present their own religions. I just interviewed a rabbi named Ram Rami Shapiro, who's a ordained rabbi but also a disciple in the Ramakrishna Vivekananda lineage and his interpretation and teaching of his Jewish folk, uh, tradition reflects that. And the arts, a hugely important factor. Great poets from Walt Whitman and T.S. Eliot all the way on to Allen Ginsberg and others, great novelists, especially J.D. Salinger, who also studied with Swami Nikolananda, they brought out these teachings in their uh, poetry and in their novels, and especially music. From the time Ravi Shankar came here and became famous among classical music fans until, and then jazz artists like uh, John Coltrane and his wife, and then rock musicians. When George Harrison met 
Ravi Shankar and they became friends. I call that the, the most important teacher-student relationship since Plato and Socrates, because it had an enormous impact. George Harrison was a great advocate of uh, Vedanta, of uh, Bhakti, and of uh, deep spiritual experience. Uh, and through him, the Beatles, this, yep. I can talk for an hour and a half on that. <laughs> and in recent decades, just quickly wrap up, what you see is the advent of Hatha Yoga, the maturation of a process that started in the 60s and 70s of people like me who were trained by gurus to represent their teachings, but who are American and were not born into these teachings, but who to do their best to represent them with dignity and integrity. We can talk about those who fail at that and who trivialize the teachings and cultural appropriation and the dilution of the teachings in the hands of certain people. And that's an important subject that we don't have time for. But I wanna also just add one more factor. And that is the change in immigration laws in 1965 that enabled immigration from India. So we now have second, third generation of people born into Hindu tradition. And we now have hundreds of temples, traditional temples in America. And we have a vice president whose mother was from Chennai. And that is another and a new phenomenon, but should not be underestimated. Because in the history of America, what happens is immigration groups are discriminated against, misunderstood, and everything else. But eventually, as they assimilate, they end up changing the fabric of America. It happened with Jews, it happened with Catholics, it happened with Muslims, and now it's happening with Hindu Americans. And more and more people learn about the, these core teachings, what we think of as yoga. Uh, through their neighbors and friends and co-workers who were born into these teachings or who adopted them like mm -hmm. I did. That's my quick version of this history. So we have time now. I'm oh, very yeah. proud. I want to, I just want to say I am very proud of myself. <laughs> I can see that, you know, it was, uh, it was, <laughs> uh, I, know, we, I, have, I, we have time for q and um, Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I could feel, you know, that there were, there were so many things that you wanted to, kind of, you know, and, and how you, how you condensed it, you know. That, that's uh, how you sell books, you say, now you have to go read my book. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, you know, even if it was a three hour topic, you would have still. I have know, done it in three yes. hours. I did it. I, a 10 lesson course for Hindu University of America, 10 90 minute courses I, I, covering, yeah, I, I, covering yeah, I, what I just did. So <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine. I mean, I mean, you know, when you were talking, I was having goosebumps about some of these stories and I had, I had, you know, uh -huh. other back stories that I was thinking about in the back of my mind, you know, when you were talking about the Guru Mai, uh, you know, she's not too far away where I live from, right, you know, in New York, uh -huh. right? So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's uh, very, very fascinating, very fascinating. I, uh, you know, cannot say anything more than that, but it's... Uh, so are you, uh, are you going to... Uh, feel I, I would like to, you know, if, if it is okay, I would like to just take Please. about you know, six or seven minutes, just quickly talk about my experience with the, with the MS, uh, you know, in yoga that I'm doing uh, with Vayu and, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, throw it out there for all the attendees here uh, who are here with us uh, so that, you know, if you guys have any questions you want to consider, uh, I would hope you want to consider, you know, uh, the uh, joining that program, uh, then you could do that, right? So just let me share my screen very, very quickly. Um, and I'll, I'll talk, uh, you know, about this uh, uh, fairly quick. Uh, so uh, the the program itself uh, is, uh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a essentially an educational program 
uh, as I said, you know, it's the first uh, yoga university uh, out of India. Uh, you know, there is uh, there is focus on research. Uh, there is focus on holistic, uh, you know, uh, education across. Uh, uh, like like uh, uh, Mr. Goldberg talked about the uh, Ashtang Yoga. Uh, you know, uh, this focus on therapy. Uh, you know, uh, so all of those uh, make uh, this this program really very really unique. Right. Uh, there are uh, in terms of you know what are the different. Uh, uh, I would say, you know, legs of this tool on which uh, YU rests. Uh, you know, the first one is education, uh, obviously very, very important. The second one is research, uh, you know, because you do want to keep on, uh, you know, uh, challenging the frontiers, you want to keep, keep moving forward. And the third and a very important one is the wellness clinics, right? I mean, if you look at the great uh, medical schools of the world, they all have a hospital attached to it, right? They, 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 they practice what they preach, and, and that's what uh, we do here at YU as well. Um, the, the program itself uh, is uh, essentially an online delivery kind of a model, uh, which has been built you know, from grounds up. It's a, it's a completely new program. However, it is a successor to a 19-year-old campus program that has been running uh, you know, uh, for the last about 19 years in uh, Bangalore, Bangalore, India, uh, called the uh, uh, Svasa program, right? Uh, uh, the Svasa program itself was the very first yoga university in the world, and now YU has succeeded, uh, you know, is, is succeeding them in uh, you know, uh, being the first out of India. Um, uh, the, the program is a four semester course uh, with 30 credits, and it is run in a low residency mode. Um, there is uh, something called a personal contact program, which is your uh, practical uh, application. You know, um, uh, obviously in current times, you know, we have to do it remotely because of the pandemic, but, uh, you know, hopefully starting this year itself, we will uh, start having that in, uh, uh, in the campus uh, in LA. Um, the different, uh, you know, aspects of the program, you know, what are, what are the th different things that are taught? So obviously you have asanas, the physical poses, you know, you cannot get away from that. Uh, there are multiple kriyas, uh, you know, which are purification techniques. Uh, you have mudras, uh, you know, it's, it's very fascinating, right? If, if you are working with a patient as a therapist and they cannot do yoga, they cannot do pranayama, they cannot, you know, they, they, they are more or less, you know, kind of uh, bedridden, cannot really do anything. You could still teach them mudras. These are simple hand gestures, right? And, and they work, uh, you know, uh, very, very effectively, right? So those are the kind of things that you learn if you join this program. Uh, bandhas are different body locks, you know, uh, when you do, uh, you know, physical asanas, you do pranayama, you generate a lot of energy, bandhas help you uh, retain that energy for a longer period of time and then let it be assimilated into the body. Uh, pranayama, obviously, a lot of us are aware of, it's a controlled breathing, it's the, it's the nectar of life, uh, and uh, and uh, something that, as, as, as Mr. Robert was talking about, you know, dhyana and the meditation practices, which have become more and more mainstream uh, in, in U.S., uh, so those are all the different things that you will learn about uh, when you join this course. Uh, um, uh, you know, I already talked about this one. As I said, you know, in the COVID times, uh, the, the PCP program is uh, online. Uh, but, you know, uh, once uh, once we have, once we are out of pandemic, hopefully, you know, in the next few months, uh, we will do that in the, in the LA uh, Center. Uh, it is done, uh, as I said, it's a four semester overall course, and there are two sessions of PCP program, uh, which runs for uh, one full week. And those are done in the first and third semester. Um, I already, uh, you know, touched upon that. You know, four semesters, ten courses, uh, thirty credits. Uh, in terms of the specialization, if you join the MS program, there are three different tracks that are available to you. Uh, three different specializations. The first one is the yoga research, wherein you will be doing ten courses, and then you will be doing a thesis, which is worth six credits, right? Uh, so that's the track if you if you choose to do yoga research. The next one is the yoga therapy, which is instead of 10 courses, because there is no thesis here, uh, you will have 12 courses. And similarly, there is one more track, which is uh, uh, your yoga philosophy, wherein you will be specializing in understanding the ancient texts, you know, understanding what's the uh, theoretical underpinnings of, uh, of yoga, are, and that is also a 12, uh, a 12 course program. Uh, so as I said, three specializations, yoga therapy, yoga research, and yoga philosophy. You could choose any one of them. Uh, what does it cost? I think uh, uh, instead of cost, I would like, you know, what is the investment? <laughs> it's an investment that you'll be making in yourself. And I think the biggest investment that you'll be making is your time, right? It's a, it's a, it's a, a fairly intense program, uh, and that's what, uh, you know, you will be, uh, you will be uh, working towards. 
but in terms of the monetary investment, uh, it's a 30 credit course. Uh, uh, each each credit uh, costs uh, $600. So you are looking at about $18,000 uh, over the four semesters, right? Um, so you have a breakdown of each semester, how, how much it costs for each of the semesters. Uh, some additional costs, uh, you know, are obviously, you know, when you travel to the PCP program to LA, uh, that would be on your own. And there's a registration fee of $150 per semester. Um, the program right now is licensed by the Bureau of Private and Post-Secondary Education in California, and uh, we are working towards uh, uh, you know, uh, securing our accreditation uh, by December 2024, which is actually a requirement. So, uh, uh, you know, the last that I uh, talked to the administration, uh, that that is uh, progressing very well. So, uh, anybody who joins the program now will be grandfathered into that accreditation, so uh, you don't have to worry about that. Um, in terms of you know a, a lot of questions are asked you know okay I will I will invest that money I will invest uh, you know uh, uh, to my time what do I get out of it what are the employment opportunities as Mr Goldberg was talking about earlier uh, spirituality mindfulness uh, meditation uh, asanas they are being more and more mainstream and you will see that you know uh, there are there are multiple uh, education uh, uh, employment opportunities available uh, once you are done with this course right so uh, you could be working in the healthcare or wellness industry you could be working in the fitness or hospitality industry. Uh, which is actually, you know, a, a fairly lucrative, uh, you know, option. Or you could be working as an academic, right? You could be doing research, right? A uh, uh, huge amount of research going on in, uh, uh, you know, how yoga impacts uh, different kinds of diseases. Uh, you know, uh, uh, measuring the effectiveness of uh, different uh, uh, techniques of yoga. All of those kind of things are, are you know, pretty cutting edge and, and a lot of research going on. By the way, some of the webinars, uh, one of the webinars that we did earlier uh, with uh, Dr. Khalsa, you know, that was uh, focused on that. There, there are some more coming up. Uh, so please, again, do, do go back to the website. If you did not listen to our previous webinars, the recording is available on the website and the schedule of the uh, upcoming webinars is also available on the website. So please do visit that. Um, and again, you know, you could be an, uh, a yoga therapist, you could be a yoga instructor, and you could be running your own yoga studio. Uh, a lot of us do that, right? So that's that's something which is very fulfilling as well. Um, so uh, in terms of, you know, uh, uh, obviously the, all of with all of those employments, you know, there is this is this is just a uh, you know kind of an indicative thing. Uh, so if you go to uh, you know these uh, uh, you know horizontal portals like ZipRecruiter or Salary.com. Uh, you want to see, you know, what kind of salaries or what kind of uh, remuneration uh, these uh, um, uh, professions uh, attract. Uh, you know, these these are again generic figures. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, it will depend upon case to case basis, right? Uh, so those are uh, those are some of the indicative numbers that you could be making uh, after you finish this course. Um, so again, uh, you know, uh, uh, will not take a lot of time uh, talking about it, but please visit the website. Uh, yuusa.org. Uh, uh, notice there are two U's in between, uh, YU and USA, uh, for more details. And if you want to uh, get attention of somebody uh, from the administration team, or uh, you know, uh, 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 you can always write to them at apply at the rate of yuusa.org. Uh, so uh, those are the those, those are some of the quick things I wanted to talk about. Uh, uh, and as I said. Uh, if there are more questions, I would be happy to take them. As a current student, I'm representing the student community uh, that uh, that is currently there, uh, you know, uh, in the MS program, and I would be happy to share my experience and answer any of those specific questions. So with that, I would uh, stop here. And uh, unless uh, you know there is any more comment from uh, uh, Mr. Goldberg, I would like to open it up for uh, questions and answers. So, There's some good questions. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> so let's just start taking them. Let me let me take them. So, okay, uh, we'll start one by one. Uh, so uh, I think the first question is probably for you, Mr. Goldberg, right? Uh, uh, about the, uh, the women uh, constituting a greater majority of yeah. accepting uh, these. Uh, so do you see that trend? Uh, I mean, I, I would actually say, you know, do you agree with that uh, trend uh, uh, as, as, a, as a general question or not? And then do you, if you do, then do you see that trend? Uh, continue? It's an important question because... <laughs> As you saw, most of the teachers who came here, the prominent ones, were, were men. But what you discover when you look into the history is, is, is it mirrors the history of other institutions and other uh, historical trends. The women had much more power and influence behind the scenes than people appreciated. 
And uh, it's, it's striking. Uh, you see it going back to Vivekananda. It was the women who, who were drawn to his teachings, who, first of all, they had more time. The affluent women had more time than their husbands because women didn't weren't in the in the professions the way they are now and so uh, they could go to the lectures and they could they became the volunteers they became the ones who raised money and rented the lecture hall or invited people to their living room or it later on made the phone calls and called the newspapers and worked to make the guru is successful. You saw it in Yogananda's case, you saw it in Vivekananda's case, and you saw it in all the gurus of the 60s and 70s. The women made things happen. They got their husbands to write checks. They, they, they did all these things. And in, even Vivekananda, there's a letters Vivekananda wrote back to India praising the American women. Uh, about you know how how incredible they were and how we couldn't do what he did. Similarly with Yogananda, he and they empowered the women. There were women made leaders in Yogananda's world. The people who he he allowed to speak in public on his behalf, representing him, were always men because it would not have been in the 1920s and 30s people wouldn't have accepted women in that role. But behind the scenes, they were running the organization and making everything work. And then later, they became representatives when things changed. Muktananda was way ahead of his time in anointing a woman to be his successor as the guru in his Siddhi Yoga lineage. But then also, a lot of the uh, gurus of the 60s and 70s trained women to be teachers in their lineage equally with men. When I was trained uh, by Maharishi, there were you know equal number of women to, as men becoming teachers. And Satchidananda, Vishnu Devananda, Iyengar, they trained women yoga teachers. And they, and now, there's many more female yoga teachers than there are men, and most yoga classes are 80% women. Why this is the case, you know, people can uh, debate. And there's still sexism at the highest ranks uh, in these teaching lineages, just as there are in corporate world, but it's changing rapidly. Uh, and and for the better, but the unsung heroes of this American Veda story were the women behind the scenes, and so I'm glad whoever asked the question brought it up. Yep, great. Uh, that that's a great insight. Uh, uh, um, I'll actually take one uh, next question for the uh, for the MS program, and we'll come back to the talk. Uh, so there is a question in terms of uh, what are the prerequisites for the MS program. Uh, so essentially, the prerequisite is that you should have a four-year uh, bachelor uh, degree uh, with you, and because it's a master's program, so you do need to have an undergraduate degree, a uh, uh, four-year undergraduate degree. If you are, uh, you know, someone, uh, you know, coming in from outside of US, uh, you know, and you uh, in your native country, uh, mostly in India, uh, you had an undergraduate degree which was uh, which was a three-year degree, then you'll probably need to do uh, some kind of a bridge course, and then you should be eligible for this as well. So, uh, you know, please. Uh, reach out to apply at yuusa.org with your specific uh, condition and we would be happy to um, um, you know, uh, give you more uh, uh, guidance on that. Um, all right, uh, taking on the next question um, you know, for you, Mr. Goldberg. Um, this is an interesting question. You know, how does the Vedantic teaching in the West influence the ecosystem and the interdependence uh, thinking along with the non-dualist principles? Divine in each human being should lead to individuals who can influence themselves to be fearless and at the same time be compassionate and empathetic to their fellow beings. Huh. <laughs> yes, it should. And I think it does. Um, 
I, I am now on the board of something called the Association for Spiritual Integrity, because here's the truth. Um, it, it's obvious that when people live these teachings, and I don't just mean understanding, I mean when they have, when they have sadhana, when they have practice, it changes people. That's why the teachings caught on. Americans saw people who take up yogic practices change for the better. And that, that's why people did studies. That's why there's a body of research. And yes, compassion and uh, em empathy and the capacity to love, the under, the, the, not just the understanding philosophically, but in addition, the feeling, the sense of connection grows in yogis. And so respect for the environment, respect for others, uh, all of that improves. At the same time, there's, there, there were uh, an alarming number of scandals of misbehaving people who were in position of spiritual leadership, whether it was some of the gurus and that I, I showed before, uh, or others, uh, and now, you know, yoga teachers and Buddhist uh, teachers. And so in addition to the natural evolution that comes with this, a, a deeper appreciation and propagation of the ethical foundations in the uh, Dharmic traditions. I think needs to be brought out more and more. Um, but yes, and there's people doing serious research now about the influence of uh, Dharmic view of the world, non-dual Vedanta, non-dual Mahayana Buddhism uh, on fact, on, on, what we can do about climate change and ecological disaster. There's some very serious scholars doing work on that. So that's one of the reasons people like me who are idealistic young people in the 60s and 70s wanted to have this training. And maybe that's one of the reasons people will come to Vayu. And that's why people, they want to change the world for the better and, and it does happen one individual at a time, not fast enough. Very interesting, very interesting. Uh, I, I, would, I would probably hasten to just quickly add one more question that came, and I think those are sort of related. Um, how, how do you think that, you know, uh, this, the, the, all the gurus that made the impact in the West for centuries, how, how did these teachings uh, make are making an impact on the next generation? And uh, what is the trend that you see uh, is being embraced by the next generation? I think it's sort of related. I, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll club it. Yeah. it um, my generation and the, the earlier generations of people who knew Yog Yogananda and all that, it was, these teachings were so new and so novel, they got a lot of attention. Now, when, you know, Amma comes on her world tours or Sadhguru or Sri Sri or somebody, it doesn't get in the newspapers even. It's mm -hmm. just commonplace. These teachings have become part of the culture. So it's harder to see their impact. It's just part of the, of the culture now. This, this trend of people uh, in studies calling themselves spiritual but not religious when you look at what they, how they see the world and their own spirituality, they're yogis, mm -hmm. you know, but they, they may not even know it. I mean, you know, but so the teachings have become part of the culture. You see it in, in pop culture, you see it in psychology talk and self-help books on Oprah, you know, and so um, it, people absorb it. And you see it uh, uh, from what I can tell, it's hard to 
know empirically, but a, a greater percentage of people in each generation move in this direction. And I think it just accelerates because now, you know, my parents thought we were weird and crazy. We were going to India, we were meditating. What is this? This is madness. Right. But they liked that we changed for the better. Mm -hmm. But, you know, my generation then had children and grandchildren and they, those kids, they just take these things for granted. Mm -hmm. it, they may reject it because you don't do what your parents did, but it's part of their, their lives. And I think that's, that's going to, you know, continue because it's the natural direction of evolution. Yeah. In fact, there is one more question which I thought of you. Uh, you just teed it up, right? Uh, uh, there's a question from uh, Farnagi. You know, what about the new words in American dictionary like karma yeah. and reincarnation? And I think that it's just a continuum, right? I mean, these things are becoming more and more mainstream. Uh, I mean, if you would have said, uh, you know, karma, probably you know, hundred years back, people would not have known what you're no, talking no. about. In and the introduction to American Veda, I I point to words like karma, uh, Maya. Uh, Dharma, even uh, yoga, and you know, a lot of you could see it in the vocabulary. And now it's even more pronounced because you know now it's just you hear. You know, I'm I'm a big sports fan. You see, you see the announcers talking about the karma of a of a baseball team. <laughs> you know, it's part, <laughs> of the, and you don't hear, uh, you know. Reincarnation is, you know, an English word, but the concept is more acceptable now. It's a surprising number of people not only believe in karma as a way to, you know, that is part of the universe's laws of nature, so to speak, but a surprising number of Americans believe in reincarnation. That's very interesting. Um, uh, before I take up the next question on the uh, MS program itself, I would like to just add to my answer for the previous question about uh, the prerequisites. I talked about the uh, special cases where uh, some people have a three-year undergraduate degree, uh, you know, uh, probably some, uh, somewhere outside uh, the U.S. and early India. If you do, if you are in that category, uh, we do accept uh, uh, that uh, bridge uh, thing to be a three-year uh, uh, work experience, uh, either either for a for-profit company or for a non-profit organization. So, if you are in that bucket and you have more than three years of experience or about three years of experience, you know, consider that to be a, a, a sufficient criteria for you to be admitted to this program. Um, there is a question in terms of you know how much is the uh, the uh, time involvement, you know, especially people who are working. Uh, so I'll tell you as an active student myself, uh, that's a question that is very dear to me. When I joined this program, I had same question. I thought about it, I brooded over it for, for quite some time. Uh, I would not, uh, you know, kind of sweet talk you into it. Um, it's not uh, It's not for, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's, a, it's a graduate program. So it's, a, it's an intense program, I would say. Uh, but it is also a program that is uh, designed for professionals. So I work full time. Uh, I work for a bank, uh, you know, um, as a risk professional. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, that this is, I have a day job. Uh, I have kids, uh, you know, to take care of. I have a family, you know, so all of that. Um, uh, the program is designed for people who are working full time. Uh, so the way it works is that you will get, uh, you know, study material, uh, which are videos, uh, you know, uh, PowerPoint presentations, uh, documents, uh, books, uh, and you'll be told, uh, you know, that here is the here is the curriculum, here is the content that you need to uh, cover uh, in this week. And then at the end of the week, uh, we have something called an office hour. Uh, so for every course that you take in that semester, uh, you have 90 minutes, one and a half hours of uh, direct interaction with the teacher, with the instructor of that course. Um, uh, and then that is where you clear up all your doubts, uh, you have any questions, uh, or if you don't have questions, there are times when we just get together and discuss things, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, if there are no questions, we just, uh, un, you know, um, unfold, uh, you know, what has been taught so far and those kind of things. So it's fairly interactive that way. Uh, and then there is a student body uh, where you interact with the fellow students, uh, you know, throughout the week, right? So the very, very vibrant program, uh, uh, again, uh, 
you can uh, tailor it according to your personal needs uh, but i will i will still tell you that it's a, it's a fairly intense program right so you should be ready for that right so uh, hopefully that answers the question um so uh so Goldberg, maybe, maybe the next question for you um, <laughs> yeah, can you speak a bit about the influence of Swami Rama? Oh yeah, I saw that. I want I, I wanted to make sure I mentioned it. He was pictured in that uh, collage of people. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, in the interest of time, uh, left out certain people. So if uh, I don't mean that as an offense, I left out some of the people who are lesser known. But Swami Rama was you know, should have been mentioned. He's, he, he had a big impact. He, uh, he came here in the 1960s um, at around the same time as many others and was just teaching small numbers of people in Chicago. And it's an interesting story because um, the Menninger Clinic, very famous uh, clinic in, in Kansas, uh, they got interested in studying uh, how people can influence bodily functions with the mind. And, and they read about the yogis, you know, legendary yogis who could control their bodies and physical functions that we think of as uh, autom automatic um, through mental processes. So they got Swami Rama to come and they did some studies and he did things like, you know, lower his heart rate and, and all that just through mental practice. And so that got a lot of attention and it became the basis for the discipline of biofeedback. And the manager clinic went on to develop these methods and Swami Rama started the Himalayan Institute in Pennsylvania, which mm -hmm. became a, 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 a principal source of uh, yoga teachings and the training of yoga teachers who dispersed throughout the country, just as Swami Satchidananda's teachers did and, and the others. And the Himalayan Institute still uh, still yes. exists, yes. They still train teachers. They, st they had a magazine called International Yoga. I think it's now only online, but they, they continue to uh, carry on uh, his legacy in a, in a very a good way. Right. In fact, uh, one other name that I probably would uh, plug in there, uh, Mr. Goldberg, is probably Amrit Desai, right? Who, who created- Amrit the Desai was also yeah. pictured. Yeah. Right. He was pictured. Uh, Amrit came here in the 60s also, I believe, he was a householder and an artist, and he had a career in Philadelphia. Right. But he, he was a yogi, and, and he started giving classes in the, uh, in the yoga tradition of his teacher, Swami Kripalu. And it grew. He became, and so he gave up his art career, and they started a center, and eventually purchased property in Western Massachusetts. and. Yep. and and then he had a scandal. Yep. He had a scandal in the 90s. Yeah. Uh, sexual very scandal. Very, it's very well known. I had to write about it in American Veda. And he left and they turned Kripalu, the, the, his disciples mm -hmm. decided to stay and keep the property and convert it from a guru centered ashram to an educational organization for the teaching and propagation of yoga. Yep. And it's the biggest yoga retreat center in America. I've taught there a few times. And, um, uh, you know, it's in the Berkshires right near Tanglewood. It's a beautiful place. And Amrit is still alive. And he's, he moved to Florida moved and has, a, has an ashram in Florida. I interviewed him. I have a podcast, if I can plug it, called Spirit Matters. It's, it's free and it's online. And we have an archive of about 250 interviews on spirituality with different teachers. And we interviewed him a few years ago. So if, you, if you're curious, you can find him in, in our archive, along with a lot of other uh, yogis and swamis, but also you know, Christians and Jews and other people. 
Uh, we have a lot of questions, but I just want to be uh, respectful for everyone's time. I think we have uh, exceeded the time a little bit. Uh, I and the YU team would be happy to uh, you know, uh, hang around a little bit and answer any questions related to the yoga program itself. Uh, Mr. Goldberg, I don't know what is your uh, you know hard stop, but you know if you if you would like to take a few more questions, I would be happy to hang around. I, but, uh, I can I can do that with another five minutes or so. Wait, sure. I see one that's a personal question. It says you were you said you were not born into these teachings. What do you actually mean by that? Not born in India? Now India, I always felt India is my spiritual home. Um, and so I, you know, I bring tour groups. I, in the last few years, I've taken tours. Of course, we had to stop for COVID. We were in South India when COVID hit last last February, uh, and we're planning one for next February. But I don't know if it's going to be possible. It's so heartbreaking what's going on in India. Yeah. But uh, what I meant by not being born into them is, you know, I was I was born into a family of uh, of from of a Jewish heritage, but raised by atheists who had no interest in religion or spirituality and all, you know, at all, they were sort of Marxists. And that's how I was until college when I started seeking and, uh, you know, discovered these teachings. So uh, scholars talk about um, um, what is the term? What are the terms they use? Oh, I, I forget. There's terms for people born into a spiritual tradition and people who adopt them so i'm an adopter i'm not i was not born into it very well uh, that's a good one there are a, a few congratulatory notes uh, uh, mr uh, you know uh, for you so i uh, you know uh, thank you for the powerful sharing you have done uh, your teachers by you and vedanta a great honor a sacred and beautiful gifts that india has given to the world are indeed transformation. This is coming from uh, actually one of our fellow students. So uh, the truth is true, whether or not we accept it or acknowledge it. So uh, you know, they're excellent. I, will, I want to say one thing, if I may, before we leave. Sure. I, I alluded to the fact that um, these the teachings can get distorted. Because and every every guru who came here, it's fascinating. I, and I studied it in depth with some of them, especially Yogananda and Maharishi Mahesh Yogi. They all had to adapt the traditional teachings to a new audience, Western people in a different culture, with a different language, at a different time of history. They all had to adapt to reach people. The skill was in adapting the teachings, changing the language, changing the emphasis and all that without distorting them, without diluting them, without corrupting them. The great teachers were able to do that. Sometimes people make concessions to Western culture and they distort the teachings in the process. So. The best example, of course, is every people who think yoga is just a form of exercise and people who treat it that way. That's, that's an unfortunate bit of uh, appropriation that we, it's inevitable that these things will happen. So my appeal to all of you and to the people taking courses at Vayu would be to be very vigilant uh, as we adapt these teachings in the future to maintain their integrity and their imp their effectiveness and not to allow them to get corrupted and distorted. That requires vigilance by people who care and it's our responsibility. Very well said, very well said. There are some questions which are sort of uh, touching upon, you know, uh, some of the some of the sort of negative connotations that you know, some people have brought up and I think you already touched upon. I don't want this to become a litigation, uh, you know, platform for those, uh, you know, things which are, are we all are aware are happening and they, they happen in any tradition, they happen in any yes. big group, right? So uh, I, uh, I, 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 I just like what you said, Mr. Goldberg, right, that uh, it's the, the onus of uh, uh, you know projecting uh, the right image of the tradition 
is on those who are actually following that tradition, right? And and I think there are there are at least three or four questions which sort of touch upon that. And uh, uh, as I said, you know, I think probably what you said suffices uh, to some extent to to at least, if not completely, then partially answer that question. Uh, there is one which uh, is is actually you know closer to my heart. And if you're okay, you know, I'll just take two minutes. To, if you could take two more minutes to just answer that. Uh, how have these teachings entered corporate America? Right. I mean, it's this is a question that I it is quite close to my heart. You know, this is something that I'm I'm going to be working on. Uh, you know, for for next few years. So maybe if you could throw some of your perspective, that would be very helpful. Um, <laughs> maybe you could answer it better than I can. But I'll tell you one thing. Uh, you see a trend over time. So now there's corporations with that offer yoga classes to their uh, employees because they know um, that their well-being is good for the bottom line and that health costs go down and absenteeism goes down. So I remember back in the 70s when the first research on meditation came out, you saw some companies have a meditation room or bring a meditation teacher in to, to teach. And now, of course, it's much more common. There's meditation rooms and yoga rooms in airports now. Uh, I, my healthcare provider sends out mailings, you know, oh, we have yoga classes, you should meditate. And I always say, yeah, you're 50 years too late for me, but I'm, I'm, glad, <laughs> I'm glad you're doing it. But um, this, you know, this is a... a, a a prominent trend and it's it's worth mentioning it's not enough but it's happening and there are you know people a lot of the teaching lineages have outreach to to corporate america and mm -hmm. they bring their teachings to them and there are you know there are people uh like the david lynch the filmmaker has a foundation where he brings uh yep. meditation to uh, inner city uh students where you know they to to help them with their health and their well-being and to you know uh veterans with ptsd so there's a lot of mainstream stuff going on and it's all bottom line americans are very pragmatic oh really this will reduce stress and my bottom line and, and the, my health care costs fine bring it on um, I just want to quickly, I see something uh, about Swami Chinmayananda, Swami yeah, yeah. Chinmayananda. Yes, I, I, you know, I, I always feel bad that I, you know, when I taught the course for Hindu University of America, I could go into all this. But Dayananda, especially who I, I'm very, uh, I got to meet him toward the end of his life, very memorably. And Chinmayananda, um, they have had a big influence. And one of the reasons I didn't give them uh, the space they deserve in American Veda is um, they were very little known outside the uh, Indian community. The, the, the Chinmaya mission, you know, they, they have a great outreach, but it's largely to uh, Hindu Americans and, and uh, young, young people. Tradition. And Dayananda was not that well known when he was here, but his his organ his uh, ashram in Pennsylvania, you know, still exists, and he had a lot of influence on people who, in turn, have had influence. So, yeah, I see that question came from Nili Maria. I know she's a patron member at uh, Ashwamedha Gurukulam. So am I. Uh, uh, you know, we visit there. Uh, I spend a lot of time there every, every yes, day. Yes, and my friend, your friend, probably too, Kalyan, uh, who runs Sindhu University, was a de you know, devotee of Swami Dayananda. Yes, so yes, yeah. He, yeah, very, very activist kind of a Swami, and uh, you know, very influential. All right, I think you know, we have taken a lot of your time, Mr. Goldberg. So I think you know, there are still more questions. We'll, we'll see how to kind of handle that. Another time, another time, yes. And, and people, people are welcome to uh, email me. Uh, oh, okay. And, and, and you know, my website is philipgoldberg.com. My and you could email me from there or get on my mailing list. Uh, or I'm Phil at philipgoldberg.com, and I'd be happy to hear from people. Um, 
that's very generous thanks a lot thank you uh, really appreciate it so so uh, thanks a lot namaste uh, and uh, once more uh, you know uh, if there are questions related to the ms program we would be happy to hang around uh, but uh, thanks a lot mr goldberg good evening it was uh, my pleasure sorry. thank thank you for having me and allowing me to share what i know it and i i wish uh, all of us uh, can do whatever we can to help the people of india right now who are so vulnerable thank you